For weeks he had been living off of hand-rolled cigarettes and ancient Sanskrit poetry. Starved, parched, six feet tall and 116 pounds, there was almost nothing left. A wasted man in a wasteland. He kept his back turned to the hastily constructed city. A jeep rolled by headed for the test site, and he waited for another flash of lightning. When it came, he could briefly make out the vast desert nothingness. Like a nuclear bomb was dropped here, he thought. The phrase would soon become a horrifying cliché, but these words passed through Oppenheimer's mind first. That day, only he and a handful of other exhausted men knew the bomb existed. In spare moments like these, Oppenheimer had been reading the Bhagavad Gita, a 4,000-year-old sacred text. It was science that he used to create the bomb, but it was a myth he used to understand what it all meant. At times, he saw himself as Arjuna, the reluctant hero forced into battle with his cousins. Arjuna appeals to Lord Krishna for help and must choose either Krishna's vast armies or his bottomless wisdom. He chooses the power of the God's mind. Arjuna's story fit Oppenheimer's own. That the wisdom of a few men could overcome the armaments of even millions was what he had been hired to prove. At other times, though, he thought of himself as Krishna. Until now, it had only been the gods who held the power to utterly destroy worlds. That power might soon become his own. Now, the announcer shouted, and the men braced themselves. There was a flash, and the pre-dawn became day, the brightest and hottest any of them had ever known. There was jubilation, but as the men celebrated, Oppenheimer's mind returned to the Gita. He would often recall his thought of that moment. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. His words were the words of Krishna. But all he said aloud was, it worked. Soon, two bustling Japanese cities would be as wasted as the New Mexico desert. For many, these blasts would bring their most important stories into serious question. The Old Testament casts man as small, subject to the whims of God and nature. These myths were just not equipped to handle the bomb that Oppenheimer had created. That day marked another major lurch in the widening of our myth gap, the space between the realities of our moment and the shared stories to which we turn for guidance. Humans need shared myths. Every society we know of was built on these all-important stories. But where do we find them in rapidly changing times? To identify a working myth, we need to look for four key elements. Explanation, meaning, story, and ritual. And for a myth to work, it must be understood and shared by everyone. Today, our myths come from marketers. Beginning in the 50s, marketers perfected the use of stories to move minds, and they revolutionized society. Take the Marlboro Man. Explanation? Here's a filtered cigarette, a better way to smoke. Meaning? get the identity of a rugged cowboy. Story, we care about him, though we know he's not real. And ritual, you can live this story every time you light up. Nearly every successful marketing campaign has created new myths, and a world hungry for just that has gobbled them up. The most successful marketers have become myth makers, but too many have abused that power. Where the great stories of the past told of a hero's journey towards higher purpose, most marketers have pushed fear, insecurity, and greed. This is the dark art of marketing, and we have all suffered under its rule. But there is a new hope, a way to fight back in the story wars. Empowerment marketing myths call people to citizenship, to live their values, and to fight the lies of the dark art. A few of the most iconic brands have discovered this powerful story wars weapon, and it has begun to reshape our world. They are breaking through the media noise and telling the truth about human nature as great myths have done for millennia. Learn to tell and live these truths, and you too will get heard and help to create a better world. This is your call to adventure, the call to enter and win the story wars. We humans have always been obsessed with communicating. It's how we turn ideas into the glue that binds us together, into tribes and societies. In oral traditions, an idea spreads from person to person, Everyone briefly owns it, modifies it, and can choose to pass it through social networks or let it die. It's survival of the fittest, and only the most compelling ideas thrive. But the last hundred years of the broadcast era changed all that. Here, audiences became consumers of ideas, not participants in spreading them. Brands and causes with access to broadcasts could guarantee attention. It became survival of the richest. Now that the broadcast era is ending, what will come next? With audiences again in charge of what ideas they seek, skip, and pass along, we are entering a time that looks like a digitally empowered version of the oral tradition. The digitoral era. Here it's survival of the fittest again, 
And what kind of ideas survive in any oral tradition? Stories. It's time we all became storytellers again. But how? It starts by thinking of your brand itself as a story. Every communication you create is another chapter in an unfolding epic starring you and your audience. On the surface of any story, you'll find characters, settings, conflict. None of these things are placed there by chance. Every visible element of a well-told story is there to illustrate a core truth about the world, a moral of the story. Morals are themselves expressions of values that the storyteller wants to share. Different values create vastly different morals and story surfaces. Joseph Campbell, who studied stories across cultures and millennia, discovered the most universally successful stories, or myths, call audiences to higher human values, like community, justice, truth, and self-expression. Campbell also uncovered the hero's journey, a formula for iconic storytelling that has always worked. We still see it everywhere, and it provides huge insights for a story-based brand. An unlikely hero, a powerless outsider, muddles through a broken world. She wants to live out her higher values, but feels powerless to do so. Then she meets a mentor who tells her so much more is possible. He gives her a magic gift and calls her to a dangerous adventure of self-discovery. On this adventure, she confronts the evil source of the world's brokenness and seizes a treasure with which she comes back to heal society. Audiences thrill to hear this story again and again. Brands can use this formula to become storytelling masters too. How? Start with the hero. This hero doesn't start out as the insider, the one with the power. She is an outsider to your brand. So, she's not you. The hero of your story is your audience. So if you're not the hero, who are you? The mentor. You are the character that reveals more is possible. You work to connect audiences to their deeper values. You teach a core truth, a moral of the story, that provides hope to heal a broken world. Stop talking about how great you are and start telling stories about how great your audience can be. And give them a magic gift, something that makes the adventure you are offering seem likely to succeed. A great brand gift has taken good story brands and made them cultural icons. Any brand can become a story brand by finding its relevance in its values, its consistency by building every communication around its moral. It finds resonance in its unique voice as mentor rather than hero, and its differentiator in its gift. But that's the easy part. In the transparent world of the digital era, mythic success will take something more, a commitment to live the higher values you espouse. Those that don't will lose credibility and their stories with it. Brands brave enough to live their values will reach iconic status and light up the digital landscape. They will tell the stories and create the myths that will win the story wars.